Carol and Chad were asking me about our trip and uh, did we enjoy it and did we do anything else? Did we just go to, to the theme parks to see Mickey and to see those characters and things like that? And I said, yeah, that's all we do. We just stay right there. We don't venture out. Uh, you, didn't do, you didn't do Universal or you didn't go anywhere else, maybe take a, you know, a little, little day off, go to the beach or something like that. No, we, we, <laughs> we, never, we never ever leave that place right there. We just get there, stay there, and just do that stuff. And Amy wishes we'd take a day or two off while we're there and recoup and recharge our batteries, but, but we, don't, we don't do that. And, uh, you know, some people would say, well, why do you go? And, and, and they were talking, you know, they said, well, you know, we go to so some of the same places, they take the same trips, maybe Florida or, or Gatlinburg, and they, they go the same trails, but try to find different ways. I mean, I mean, if you want somebody to take you to Gatlinburg, you're going to ask Chad and Carolyn, and you're going to ask that family right there, ask them, how do you get around Gatlinburg? They, they know Gatlinburg like the back of their hand. Uh, they're, they're just, uh, they just go there. And so people, why do you, why do you go to Disney all the time? Why do you like going there? Well, I enjoy going there. Like I said, Amy tolerates it. She goes along with me, and uh, the kids the kids love it. And and there, don't you? Yes, you do. Uh, <laughs> and I love it too. But uh, I have a conquering uh, thing about it. And she picked it. She nailed it last time we went. She said he wants to conquer it, and I do. We're we're men. We want to conquer things. I I want to. It's not going to whoop me. I'm going to whoop it, and I'll keep coming back until I'm victorious. Uh, and that's, that's the way guys are, so I want to conquer that thing. There's another reason I, I go as, as well, and, and since we have a, a couple of minutes here, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you this because I, I'd like to share it later, but I will forget. A, another reason I do go there, and I go there with, with my eyes open, and I really should be more attuned to it when I'm in at home as well and you should be as well but I, I go there with the intention that there's there's you're going to meet a lot of people from different countries when you go there a lot of uh they're, they're just from everywhere from everywhere they workers there the cast members the employees uh people that are on vacation and taking everything in and you you get the opportunity to to be a good example. You get the opportunity to share while you're there. You get the opportunity to not be the grouchy old nag or hag or the, or the, the donkey's backside while you're there. Just because somebody cuts in line does not mean that you have to get upset. Now, d- did I speak up one time when somebody cut in line? Well, I, I kind of did. I kind of did. It was, we'd, we'd been there an hour, and then somebody came up, and they wanted to come right in front of us and all these other people. And we're like, you know, we've been here. That's why we got here an hour earlier. And you, you're here one minute before the show starts, and you know you can't cut in like that. But anyway, it gives you, a, it gives you an opportunity to be a good witness. And, and I'm going to give you a couple examples. And, and I, I really, and I tell you this all the time, I've got to learn to take it to the next step and close the the deal when the door is open. We've watched William Fay give his testimony, and I'm thinking, man, if William Fay would have been with me when we went through that study, how to share Jesus without fear, if he'd have been with me, I'd, I'd like I gotta sit with him for just a little bit and watch him close the deal. I'm terrible about closing the deal, but we were and, and I, I we were at. Uh, we were, we were at a, a restaurant you know, on a lunch, and um, uh, the, the, the neighbors, the, comp- the group sitting next to us, the family sitting next to us, whether they did it intentionally or, they, or, or it was unintentional, but they left without paying for their meal. And, and it was a high-dollar meal, too. Um, so I, and I, the, the server, she, she's working for tips. She's getting tips. I mean, I don't know what her hourly wage is, but she's expecting some tips and the tip that should have been with this meal should have been a considerable am- amount of money. And so I saw, I, we saw the family leave, and Amy's like, I think they left without paying for their meal. And, uh, and, and maybe, maybe just in the hustle and bustle of everything, they just s- s- absent-minded, they just walked out. I don't know. Uh, so I give them the benefit of the doubt. So I asked the waitress, who was ours as well, I said, did our, did our neighbors leave without paying for the meal? And she said, yes, but don't you worry about that. Disney's got their name. They'll take care of this. You don't have to worry about that. I said, that's fine, but, 
but you're not going to get your tip. So I said, let me, let me give you something. Let me give you what I have here in my wallet. Let me just give you. I thought she was going to cry. Well, she did. She looked like she was going to cry. She appreciated that, appreciated that a whole lot. And um, I only did that because I've had other people show me grace and mercy and give me blessings uh, really throughout the last few years. I've seen people go above and beyond and bless me in certain ways. And I've always got this mentality now. I'm starting to live with this mentality. Can I bless somebody else? Because I need to do that for the glory of God. And I really should have closed the deal a little bit better with this lady. I said, I'm doing it because, you know, I feel it's the right thing to do. I should have said something. But I didn't. I'm going to learn from this, hopefully. And then on the way home, uh, uh, in, the, in the plane there, we, we flew back into Memphis, and there was this lady. As soon as that plane got off the ground, she's going to the bathroom. And... Uh, her husband was sitting in the front of the plane. She was in the back. I thought something's a little different about this lady. And uh, the guy sitting next to me, she asked him, she said, do you want to move in here? Because she came back. She had to get up again. She asked him, I'm sorry, my belly's hurt. You know, and do you want to sit here in the middle so I can just be on the aisle so I can go to the bathroom about five or six times during this two-hour flight or something? And uh, finally, I just kind of closed the book I had, left it on my lap, and uh, she sat down again. And I, I, I just asked her, I said, you, how you doing? You fly much? And she says, oh, yeah, I fly all the time. I'm thinking, well, you're not acting like it. Uh, I'm the one that should be nervous here. But uh, so let's talk, and I'll try to t- take your mind off of this. So we start talking for a while. She saw my little Disney wristband that I had on to get in, to look, uh, get in the park there. And um, she, she says, oh, you, were you at Disney? I said, yeah, we were. And she says, we were too. And so we, we talked the whole time about Disney. Talk about Disney. What else can you do? That's a great thing to talk about, Disney. And I had a book there on my lap, and she said, what's this you're reading? I've been asked to teach at uh, West Kentucky, teach an Old Testament class. The first time, it starts, starts tomorrow morning. And she says, what's that book you're reading? I said, well, about two weeks ago, I got asked to fill in for this teacher who was unable to teach a class and for, for whatever reason. So I'm trying to catch up so I can be a little bit ahead of the students as, as they log on tomorrow. And I said, I'm trying to read this Old Testament book. And I said, I really like it. I said, I know the author real well, and I enjoy all of his work. And so she gets out her phone. She starts taking down some notes. Uh, she had already been writing down Disney stuff. So I got to talk about Disney and Jesus on the way home. And I thought, that's the greatest trip ever. That's, the great, that's two great things to be talking about right there on the flight home. And so I got to share with her a lot of stuff. And she's she says, well, I, can I take that class? I said, yeah, it's all online. You can take it from Arkansas, or I'm sure you can get on there. We can hook you up. And uh, so she's, she says, well, send me some information for the class if you teach it again. So I, I did that, and she says, she says she's Catholic. She's been through confirmation. Uh, she says, but there was never a connection with God. And so we had a really good discussion uh, about all that stuff, and I believe she realized that, and I'm, I'm almost I, I'm almost 100% sure, 99.9% sure that she does not attend church anywhere. And hopefully during that 45 minutes there that we talked, that she realized that there is more to God than just going to a, a Catholic or Christian school and going through some kind of class that says you're confirmed and that she knows that she needs to have a relationship with God. But I should have done a better deal, of, a better job of of uh, finalizing that and asking her she does understand sin she knows that uh, her name is Karen you can you can write that down and pray for Karen Karen gave me her email address and she says I want you to send me some information so I'm going to start uh, you know kind of con- conversing with her through email and uh, just uh, inquiring of her a little bit more but that's one of the reasons one of the reasons I have a lot of fun when I go I enjoy it immensely but that's one of the reasons that I do go because you get to see a, a, a huge array of beliefs, thoughts, uh, religion, non-religious people. A- Amy said she saw one time, and you say you saw somebody put down a mat. At last time we went, she put down a mat probably at noon, three o'clock, you know, something like that, and just started praying. I, I'm sure they were going toward Mecca or something like that. But, uh, uh, and, and this lady I was talking to, you know, she felt, she said, she said, uh, I said, I, I said, I, I said, there's going to be Catholic people in, in heaven for sure. I said, but I said, I understand how the Catholic teaches that, 
that, you know, kind of go to confirm. I mean, you got to go to good confession. And I said, I said, if I'm nervous on this plane ride right here, I don't have to call my priest and ask him to pray to God for me. I said, me and my nervousness, I'm going to pray to him right here and now. And she, she's like, yes, that's, that's what I need. So you be praying for Karen. And, uh, you know, just, just keep your, that's one of the reasons I go. I, I look forward to that. I was forced into doing that one time when we went because I was taking an evangelism class uh, when, I was, when I was in school. And it kind of forced me when I went on that trip one time. And now I really look for it, and I, I enjoy that, and I just wait for God to open a door. I need to b- do a better job about looking for opening open doors here, and you do, you do as well. So uh, that, that's, that's my take on it, and I'm glad I got to share that story, and uh, glad we, we got to go. And I just need to be more intentional, even, even here in, in Graves County, Marshall County, and this area. All right, Luke, Luke chapter 15. I believe we have looked at these parables before, possibly. Uh, we're going to look at the last parable here in this chapter that Jesus, uh, Jesus talks about. He's talking to the scribes. He's talking to the Pharisees right here. But, but in Luke chapter 15, you see the parable of the, of the lo- lost things. The lost sheep, the lost coin, uh, the lost son here, the, the prodigal son as we're familiar with. We have this, and actually there's two sons. We're going to look at this scripture, and we're going to see that there, maybe that possibly there's two sons here that are lost in, in uh, you know, verses 11 through the end of the chapter there. Uh, we're going to see two sons that are lost. One we know we're very familiar with. He, he goes to a faraway land, a distant country, a distant place. And we, we understand this, this younger one. We assume him to be lost, but then there's the elder son that stays home, right? And, and we, we never really think about him. We never think about the elder son, but he is in the father's house. And we're going to see that he might be lost as well. Just quite possibly, both of these boys are lost. And we never really think about the second one being lost. But Jesus is giving this parable to the Pharisees. He's talking to them. Don't turn there, but let me read to you Matthew 21, uh, right here, chapter 21. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parable, parables they understood that he was speaking about them he was speaking to them so the the pharisees the scribes um, the sanhedrin as as jesus is talking to them they understand what he's talking about who he's talking to what the 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 motive is behind his parables So they understand what he's getting at, and they understand it with this parable as well. And in Luke 15, you just cannot get away from the fact of who this is pointed to. The Pharisees, these these people, they're grumbling. The scribes, they're grumbling. Verse 2, it says, they're grumbling. They're upset because Jesus eats with who? Jesus eats with sinners. Chad was playing a song as we came in, I I believe, this this morning. That said the same thing. Um, But but they were grumbling because Jesus is eating with sinners. Verse 1 there in chapter 15. Now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near him to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with sinners. Them. Now, knowing what you know about the, uh, the parable of this son here, knowing what you know with just that verse, the Pharisees and the scribes begin to grumble. And we're going to read here, this, the older child is going to begin to grumble, the one in the father's house. If you think of somebody in the father's house, who do you think of in, Jer- in Jesus' time? Somebody in the Father's house that's going to be serving in the Father's house. Who's it going to be? The, the Pharisees and the scribes. And what are they doing? They're grumbling. And we're going to find that this elder son who is in the Father's house is grumbling because the Father is receiving a lost person. Jesus is receiving lost people. The church is ticked off. The church is upset. They don't, 
They smell different than us. They're not as clean as us. They don't dress like me. They don't wear, uh, they, they, didn't, they didn't iron their clothes before they came to church. They look a little raggedy. And we think, well, that, that's not the appearance to give. They don't have good grammar. They don't have, uh, they don't have good vocabulary. They don't, uh, th- maybe they tell, maybe they share off-color jokes and that offends and that, that upsets you, you, you t- let God work on them. Let God convict them. God's still convicting me. Of th- there were some things that God convicted me immediately of. There are some things that are a process that God is separating me from. So we can see. We can see the older boy. We can see that who Jesus is talking to right here just by through these two verses when we get to, get to looking at him here in just a moment. So they're grumbling. They're upset. They're grumbling, that, uh, they're grumbling, they're upset, so Jesus brings these three parables right here, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. Now, a lot of scholars would say that Jesus' point of emphasis here is the younger. The younger son is what the text is all about and what Jesus was really wanting to drive home. And, and when, when celebration comes, we usually stop there. We usually stop reading this parable when we get to the point the younger son comes home and the father throws a, a big party for him and everybody celebrates and everybody's happy. And a lot of scholars would say that's, that's the, the motive behind this. Then there's other scholars who would come in and say, oh, no, 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 it's all about the elder son. His parable is all about the elder son who is at home with the father. So Jesus is, is looking at the legalist here. He's looking at the Pharisees and the scribes. And he's saying, I even want you, the ones in the Father's house, to come into a relationship with him. I even want you to come home. So he, Jesus is showing and he's saying, those that appear the closest to the Father can often be the ones who are farthest away from the Father. Here's the first thing. We're far away. We are far away from the Father when we reject what brings Him joy. Verse 25. You know this story, so let's, we'll just move into it. Now, his older son was in the field. Remember, remember, the, the younger has come to the father. I want my inheritance. He's a younger son. He did not get half. He would have gotten a third of the inheritance. At best, would have been his allotment. He comes to the father. And he says, I want to cash out right now, and I want to go. And we know he, he goes. He spends his money on uh, you know, fast cars, fast women, and fast living, or however you want to say it. But he does all that. And where does he find himself? He finds himself in that pig's pit. And he says, look, even these, even these pigs have better stuff to eat than me. I need to go back. I need to go back. He comes to his senses. And on his way home, he's rehearsing the whole time. What am I going to say to the Father? What am I going to say to the Father? How am I going to grovel up to the Father? How am I going to uh, pay penance for, for what I've done, for the shame that I've brought on my Father's name? And what does the Father do? The Father says, shh. Not a word is needed. The Father grabs the wayward individual and clutches him see that's that's a picture of you too you go back to the father and you ask forgiveness you don't have to rehearse what you need to see say the father is there with open arms ready to embrace you but now the older brother the older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing so the other the older son has been uninformed of what's going on. He didn't have text messaging back. He didn't have a cell phone in his pocket. I mean, maybe they sent out a smoke signal or something to send, tell him to come back to the house. Something was going on. Maybe he smelled some barbecue cooking and his belly got a little grumbly, so he, he walks back to the house. He, the older son was in the field doing whatever he was supposed to be doing out there, tending crops, working. We really don't know, but at some point in the day, it's time for him to go back to the house or he, goes, he, he, he realizes something is going on. He goes back to the house and what does he find? He approaches the house and he hears music. Now that music that, you, that the word is right there is symphony. It's an orchestra. There's a, lot of st- there's a lot of instruments being played. It's not just like a flute or a little recorder. Uh, that would have been maybe commonplace even in, in this person's 
culture, even in this time. But that's not what it is. There is a whole orchestra that he hears. And it says not only that, but he hears music and he hears dancing going on. Uh, he, he senses, he hears that dancing. He hears a chorus. There's a loud, uh, there's loud commotion from the house as he approaches that. So there's music, there's singing, there's a chorus, which is the dancing, and he hears all of this as he approached the house. Now, this, uh, this is probably something that this son had never experienced before, at least probably pretty sure not to this level. And he's wondering, what in the world is going on? I hear the sound of music. I hear dancing, I hear singing, I hear laughter. He senses joy in the Father's house. Now, there's some people that get upset when there's joy in the church, too. So he calls a servant. He summoned, verse 26, he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. So what's going on? How come I didn't know about this? What's happening in there? What's all this commotion? What's all this joy? What's all this excitement that is building up that I, that I feel out here? Verse 27, the servant says to him, your brother, just imagine how ecstatic maybe this servant might have been. He says to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. So your brother is here. Aren't you excited? Who, wouldn't you think? You would think everybody's excited. The father's happy. The household is happy. The servant is happy. There's a big meal going on. Everybody's happy. Verse 28. What do we see here in verse 28? He became angry. Why would he be angry? Why is the older angry? He has this anger when we are far away from the father. We reject what brings him joy. And the older son is rejecting what has brought the father joy. We do that. We do that. We want everybody to be as upset as we are. Something happens. We want everybody to feel the same way we feel. Uh, don't, don't put a good spin on it. Don't put a good tone on it. Don't, don't uh, try to make it feel warm and fuzzy. Uh, that's, that's what we do. We want everybody to be on the same level we are. We want to bring people down. And, and so this, this elder son, he's upset. He's upset because his heart is not in tune with the father's heart. He's not on the same plane as the father. So what drives this elder son to his anger? Well, he's driven to anger because he resents the response of the father. It's not so much that he is focused upon the younger brother, maybe, but maybe he's more focused on the response of the father. It's about the father here. The father is representing, um, he, he's, he's representing this household, and the younger brother has come home, and, and the older brother senses that, hey, the father is embracing sin right here. The father is celebrating. This younger brother of mine has lived in sin for this time, and the, the father is, is celebrating him coming back. So he celebrates, he, he understands this. How in the world can my father celebrate sin? So he's angry. He's fired up about it. Look at verse 32. This is the father. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. He says we had to celebrate. We must celebrate. The, the father is saying, I had to do this. It's the same word that Jesus used when he talked to, to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He said the son of man must be lifted up. Uh, the son of man had to be lifted up. This must happen. The father is saying this had to be done. The father is saying I had to do this for the younger son or I was going to pop. You ever anticipated anything so much that, that you were about to pop? Maybe it was a trip. 
the first time we ever took the kids to the, kids to, to the, to the Disney there. Uh, we, we withheld that information from them for, for months, I mean really just days before we ever left on that trip. And we as parents were about to pop wanting to tell them this. That's what he's saying. The father is saying, I had to do this. I had to celebrate the son returning. I was about to pop. And we got a new baby back there. Maybe mom and dad. Mom was about to pop literally. But uh, maybe mom and dad were about to pop with the anticipation of seeing that new baby. You know, moms are like that. They just want to have that baby that they've carried around inside them for nine months. They're just this anticipation of being able to see that thing that they felt for so long. They're about to pop. With excitement, grandparents with a, ba- with a new baby as well, with a new grandchild, they're about to pop with seeing it. Gra- grandparents, maybe if you live away from your, your grandchildren, you're about to pop in, with the anticipation of seeing them. Now, they also say that grandparents at times are about to pop with the anticipation of seeing them leave as well. <laughs> that's, what the, that's, what, that's what the father's saying. He's saying, I had to do this. This must be done because I was about to, to bust open. I had to do it. But the elder brother, he, he equates this with celebrating sin. So this younger brother, he comes home. The father sees him. Now, I wonder, I wonder what would have happened if the elder brother had seen the younger one coming first. What would have happened if the elder brother would have seen the younger one in the distance first? Would the elder brother have ran to the younger one and said, Oh, man, I'm glad you're home. we got to get you cleaned up for pop seizure, and we just got to get you spit shined and, and get this stench off of you. we got to get you looking pretty before you walk back into the house. Or would the elder brother, would his response have been, Well, you dirty, no good so-and-so. I have been carrying your load for this time. I've been doing your chores. I've been taking out your trash. Would the elder brother, would he have unloaded on the the younger one who had returned home? What if it was a lost person? What if it was somebody that was was lost and they're looking for a church? They're searching. They're looking for, for, for Christ. And when they walk into a church for the first time and they experience the elder brother think about that if the elder brother got angry at the return of the lost person how is it that the church responds when a lost person walks in here do we act as the elder because if we have if we portray the elder in our response that person's going to walk into a church and say I knew this is the way that God would treat me and they'll leave and never come back. Are we excited to see the lost come in? Or do we have an elder brother mentality? Where have you been all this time? I've been doing the work for you. What happens? What happens when a lost person runs in to the elder brother before? They meet the Father. We're far away from the Father when we, when we resist His attitude as well. Verse 28, we have the attitude of the Father. The attitude of the Father is He's overcome with compassion. But then we have the attitude of the older brother. And His attitude is He became angry. He was wildly unrestrained he had this wrath about him the slave had told him the father is in there celebrating because the younger son has come home but the older brother erupts with an explosion a fiery angry outburst because there's a party going on for the son how did the father know that the older brother was even outside right here. He became angry and was not willing to go in. His anger had erupted in such a violent fit that the father, probably over the music, over the dancing, 
over the excitement that was happening, the father hears it and he comes outside. The father comes outside and he pleads with him. He pleads with him. Uh, the father came out and began pleading with him. Come on, let's go inside. When we erupt in anger, it says something about our relationship with the father. See, he wasn't willing to go in with the father, even though the father was pleading with him. There was joy in the house, but there was no joy in the older brother. There was happiness in the house, but there was no happiness in the older brother. And the father is pleading. His, his pleading wasn't, his, his, the pleading wasn't just, hey, you just walk on in there, I'll be behind you. The father's pleading was, hey, I'm going to come with you. I want to do this with you. I want to wrap my arm around you as well. I want to be with you and walk inside with you. I want to do this together. But the older brother, he kind of turns it and says, he says, I've been treated like a slave. Verse 28 here. He became, he became angry, was not willing to go in, and the father came out and began pleading with him, let's do this together, let's go in together. He wouldn't have any of it. But verse 29, he answered and said to his father, look, for so many years I've been serving you. It's, the, it's like the Greek word for slave. I've been your slave for so many years. There's no happiness here. There's no joy here. There's no vision. I don't see anything, anything greater, any plans better. It's drudgery. It's slavery. It's just another day in the Father's house to me. That's what's been going on. That's what he says. For so many years I've been serving you. Then he has this, he has this attitude of a slave. Then he has this attitude of superiority. He says, I've never neglected a command of yours. If you, yeah, you can't believe that's right. It, it sounds like the publican in, in Luke chapter 18 who said, who said, who said I've never neglected uh, a commandment of yours. I've kept all the rules. I'm the righteous one. Sounds like the same thing. The, the older brother is saying, I didn't do this. I didn't do that. I, I've done everything that you've asked. I've lived the right way. So now you, the Father, you have an obligation to me, and that's the way we treat God. See, you can be lost in sitting here today. Because you think, I've, I've lived a good life, I've been a nice person, I've treated others well, and God is obligated to meet my, to serve me, to meet my wants. God is never obligated to do what we think he should do. See, this elder brother had this mentality of a legalism. If I follow this pattern, if I follow these rules here, then the higher up person is obligated to serve me. Let's finish verse 29. He says, I've never neglected the command of yours, and yet you have never given me a young goat so that I may celebrate with my friends. He says, look, he says, I, you haven't even given me a young goat, but you've, you've given him a, a fatted calf. You haven't even offered to have a, a, a weenie roast for me, but yet you've given him this smorgasbord at, the, at a Ritz uh, restaurant, and you've done all this for him. See, the elder brother was worried about what he was going to get. Verse 12, the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. I told you the younger brother only got one-third at best of what the inheritance was. The older brother got two-thirds of everything that the father had. The younger brother was focused not on the much that he had, but he was focused on the minuscule little that he didn't get of the brother's. What's our focus? What is our focus in life? Are we not thankful for what we have? The older brother should have been thankful for everything that he was going to inherit. What is our attitude? His, 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 also, his attitude was his unthankfulness, this indifference here. He says, I wanted to celebrate with my friends. 
The older brother was not interested in the father. He had very little interest in the father. He says, I want to celebrate with my friends, my peers. So that he didn't say anything about fellowshipping with the father. He wanted to do his own thing as well. We all know the younger brother wanted to do his own thing. Now we see that the older brother had a problem with doing his own thing as well. And where did he live? He lived in the father's house. He was close to the father. He doesn't even address the father by name. Uh, verse, verse 29, it says, he, he said to the father, but his words were, as Jesus spoke them, look, I've been serving you, command of yours, and yet you have never given me anything. He says, you look here, I've done this for you, but he never calls him father. He never has this intimate communication, this intimate response to say that there's something more between them. Verse 30. But when this, boy, you just hear those S's rolling off right there. But when this, like a serpent in the garden that came up and spread a lie, sounds like Satan has infected the older brother's ear as well. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. He says, you're responsible for this, Father. You're embracing this. So far, this parable has been kind of depressing. But what's the question? The question is, we see in the early part of chapter 15, the shepherd finds the lost sheep. The woman finds the lost coin. But does the elder son ever come back into the father's house? We're not really told. Remember, Jesus is addressing the, the Pharisees here. He's addressing the, the people that are the legalists. We talked about that at the beginning. He says, you're the older brother. I care for you, is what the father is saying here. I care for you. No matter how far you get away from the father, no matter if you're the younger brother and you have ventured to a faraway land and you have turned your back on the father and you have walked away from him for years, it says, Father is ready to celebrate your return. It doesn't matter if you're that prodigal child or if you're the child that has come to church your whole life and thinks you're old something. The Father loves you too. The Father loves both of them. Jesus is saying, you need to come to me. That's what he's saying. He says, it doesn't matter if you're far away or if you're sitting in the Father's house this morning. Jesus says, come to me. Come to me. Those who appear the closest to the Father can be those that are the furthest away. Those that are in the church can be the ones who are just hard-headed enough to say that I can do it on my own. Those that are in the church can be those, the ones that are just stubborn enough that can say at the end of their life, say, well, I attended church 75% of the time. Surely God will let me in. He owes me that. But you never directed your heart toward the Father to even call Him Father. See? You see? You're that one who's saying, look, I deserve. Look. The first thing you need to do is address Him as Father. He is saying, come to me, to you today. Okay? Let's bow your head. I'm going to ask you to bow your head. Go ahead and stand up as they're I'm going to play this last song for us.